Imagine you are clinging to a sheer rock face thousands of feet up on the Grand Teton when you slip and fall, your foot catching between two rocks, the full brunt of your weight sickeningly snapping your ankle. Fifty years ago, to get help, a member of your climbing party would spend eight hours hiking to the Jenny Lake Ranger Station to alert rescue rangers, who would then hike up the mountain carrying personal gear and a litter. You would be lowered to safety in a painstakingly slow process, taking hours or even days, prolonging your suffering and exposing you and your rescuers to rockfall in unpredictable mountain weather. Today, you call 911 on your cell phone. Twenty minutes later, several rangers are inserted to your location from a rope dangling beneath the helicopter in a maneuver known as short haul. They take full responsibility for you, stabilizing your ankle and packaging you for extraction. You are then swiftly flown to the valley floor while suspended beneath the helicopter. The risk to you and your rescuers is heightened. The helicopter may crash. Your rescuers share this risk with you. But this time, like the vast majority of times, you land on the valley floor and are whisked off to the hospital. Grand Teton National Park is full of the wonders and dangers of the great outdoors. Visitors have the right to explore the park, exposing themselves to hazards. While they are responsible for their own safety, Government programs like the Jenny Lake Rangers are responsible for rescuing any injured or endangered visitors. The development of short-haul helicopter rescue introduced new and greater risks to rangers as well as accident victims. While the efficiency of short-haul greatly benefited victims, the rangers taking responsibility for their safety assume greater risks in order to save more lives. People are responsible for their own actions while they're out there in the mountains and uh, we hope that they are well equipped with good equipment and good information and make prudent decisions while they're there. Um, but when they do get into trouble and they do need to call us for help, when we get there, um, we do, we really take responsibility for them. In the 1930s, Grand Teton National Park hired two ill-equipped rangers to serve as rescue personnel. After World War II, the influx of visitors created a greater need for an expanded search and rescue program with better trained rangers. The park first hired climbing rangers from the 10th Mountain Division of the Army, which emerged during World War II. The development of the first mountain rescue techniques, such as pulley-aided lowering systems for litters, originated from this group. In 1952, the park formed the Jenny Lake Ranger Program, a group of climbing rangers dedicated to, and trained for, search and rescue. Although refinements were made to mountain rescue techniques over time, some victims' deaths were inevitable. They were in locations too remote to be physically carried out of the mountains, or died of their injuries or hypothermia before they could be lowered to safety. The need for a more efficient and time-saving rescue method was apparent. Helicopters and trained pilots became more accessible during the Vietnam War, when the U.S. military first used helicopters in combat. A helicopter was first used during a rescue in the park in 1967. Over the course of three days, a climber with an open leg fracture was painfully lowered about 1,800 feet down the north face of the Grand Teton to the Teton Glacier. He was then loaded into a helicopter perched on the glacier and flown to the hospital. The use of a helicopter saved valuable time and energy that rangers would otherwise expend hiking into an accident scene and carrying the victim out of the wilderness. However, victims still needed to be lowered to a helicopter landing zone before being loaded and flown to safety. Time is of the essence in a mountain rescue. The sooner a severely injured victim is rescued and receives medical attention, the greater his chance of survival. In many instances, a victim's chances of survival greatly decrease if he does not receive treatment within one hour of being injured. This window of time is called the golden hour. In the early 1980s, Pete Armington was head ranger of the Jenny Lake program. He recognized the need to be able to rescue victims within the golden hour. Beginning in the 1970s, search and rescue programs in Europe were pioneering a new helicopter rescue technique dubbed short haul. In short haul, rangers are transported to the scene dangling from the end of a 100-foot rope that is securely attached to the underside of a helicopter. A ranger clips his climbing harness to the end of the short haul line, and the helicopter flies directly to the accident scene, where the ranger then unclips. Once there, rangers provide basic medical care and take full responsibility for the victim. They package their now patient into a litter or screamer suit. A ranger and the patient are then clipped to the short haul line and extracted off the mountain by the helicopter. When it lands, the patient is loaded into the helicopter and flown to medical care. Pete Armington traveled to Canada, where short haul was already in use, to see the technique in action. He devised a plan for implementing short haul into the Jenny Lake program to save more victims by reaching them within the Golden Hour. Due to Armington's efforts, by 1985, the U.S. Park Service granted approval and funding to the Rangers to initiate a legitimate short haul program. In 1986, I was on the very first short haul that we did in, in Grand Teton, and in that particular um, rescue, we saved a life. This person had the lowest uh, body temperature of anybody they had seen at St. John's at that 
point and survived. I think the first time you do something is is probably very vivid, and it is in my mind because we, heli, we rappelled out of the helicopter. This was on Mount Moran, and and then we received a litter, packaged the patient. She was in a really bad way, and then we short hauled that patient down to a the Mount Moran scenic turnout, actually, and it was dark when we when they brought her down to that parking area so we barely you know got her out of the mountains and that one that one is a lasting memory for sure the tool of short haul all of a sudden became the thing that could help us get people out of the mountains in that golden hour although short haul proved itself a very useful tool rangers were wary of the high risks involved with the use of helicopters at high altitudes and rugged terrain these risks like mechanical malfunctions vulnerability of people on the line crashes had to be weighed carefully against the dire needs of each rescue. Accidents involving the helicopter would most likely result in loss of life. We've had a very successful program here in the Tetons. Um, fortunately, we haven't had any of those catastrophic failures. Under Head Ranger Rennie Jackson in the 1990s, the Rangers concentrated training on short haul, working to improve the technique. Their highly refined procedures increased the overall efficiency and safety of the operation. On the afternoon of July 26, 2003, the capabilities of the short haul program were tested. It was on the mountains uh, for the friction pitch rescue in 2003, where we had uh, ended up flying off, I think it was seven people. A massive bolt of lightning struck the Grand Teton at 3.30 p.m., hitting a climbing party that was scaling the friction pitch of the Exum Ridge. Soon after, the local sheriff's dispatcher received a desperate 911 call from one of the climbers, triggering the start of the Friction Pitch Rescue, a rescue that utilized three helicopters and involved nearly 50 rescue personnel. Six of the climbers sustained injuries ranging from mild shock to severe burns. Rod Liberal was left dangling unconscious on the 200-foot rock face, folded backwards, belly skyward. Erica Summers was killed instantly. Six rangers were inserted and spent the next three hours short-hauling five of the climbers to the lower saddle. After two strenuous hours of technical maneuvering, Rod Liberal was flown directly to the valley floor. Lastly, in the fading alpha glow, Erica Summers' body was blown down. The rescue concluded at 9.08 with only 15 minutes before dark. The rangers were left to descend down the Grand Teton by starlight, reaching the saddle at midnight. It was the first time we had a rescue of that size. We've had an even bigger one since but to see that we could actually do this and take what seemed like an almost uh, impossible situation and solve it in a few hours was uh, convincing. In three hours, 13 patients and rangers had been short hauled off the mountain. This immense operation with the efficient use of short haul saved one or more of the lives of family and friends of exercising their right to climb in the park. Rangers responding to the call for help placed themselves at considerable risk by fervently working in and around helicopters during the tail end of the storm to save the visitors. There are high risks associated with short haul. That's why we're very prudent um, about when we decide to use that tool. All rescue work is risky and you have to accept a certain level of risk. And I think that uh, the benefits of the short haul that we've, we've had and we've seen with people that have been seriously injured um, and the, the exposure time for people in, in dangerous situations has uh, been worth it. Once short haul happened, it really, it, it, the, the catch-all phrase is it revolutionized mountain rescue. And it really did because it changed everything. Today, short haul plays a key role in technical mountain rescue. Utilizing short haul, the rangers can access accident victims in remote or unaccommodating locations and extract them within the golden hour. In less than three decades, short haul has transformed search and rescue in Grand Teton National Park, nationwide and globally. Short haul is a powerful tool, especially when combined with modern technologies like GPS and cell phones. In the 1980s, the development of short haul rescue introduced new and greater risks to rescue rangers working within the often perilous Grand Teton National Park. Despite these risks, the Denny Lake Rangers continue the use of short haul to efficiently extract visitors and swiftly fly them to safety. Visitors continue exploring the park with their safe extraction reassured. Accepting greater personal risk, rangers today save lives that, only 50 years ago, might have otherwise been lost.